Hello students, you are welcome to prep class to us. And today with you is Mr. Chima, your prep class tutor on chemistry. So today very quickly we are going to be looking at chemistry for Jam 2020. So students, as always, please do not forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and like all our videos. Remember to always share our videos on Facebook so that other students like you who are looking for such an opportunity will not miss out. I don't know if this, this is the first time of you uh, watching our videos. We have made more uh, certain videos on chemistry on YEC. So if you are a YEC student, you can also visit our YEC channel and watch all our videos where we have destroyed calculations and many other um, wire questions of chemistry. But today we are going to be looking at JAM chemistry for the year 2020 and quickly I'm going to be taking your questions number one to five. Question number one. Which of the following substance is not a heterogeneous mixture? Which of the following substance is not a heterogeneous mixture? Now, the first thing we ask ourselves is, what is a heterogeneous mixture? What is a heterogeneous mixture? And I said here, a heterogeneous mixture is a mixture in which its composition or constituent is not uniform hmm. throughout the mixture. That is, the mixture in which its composition, that's what it can contains, are you following, is not uniform throughout the mixture. This simply means that one could still see the constituent particles in it. I'll give you an example. If I put a spoon of salt or sugar in water and stir it, are you following? If you look at the water or that sugar solution through a glass, you will notice that it is still colorless. It still assumes the color of what? Water. That is a homogeneous mixture. The, 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 the soap would completely dissolve in the, in the water solvent and you don't need to see any particle of the water solvent. Now, if I should take a spoon of milk and put it into water, or a spoon of milk and put it into water, are you following and stir or chocolate, and chocolate powder or milk powder, put it inside water and stir, you can still see slightly to some extent the particles of those milk or chocolates in that water. Which simply means that that is not a word homogeneous word mixture. The particles are not completely mixed completely. Mm -hmm. Or let's say I take a spoon of soup and place it in a glass cup. You can still see some of all those particles in it, telling you that that is not what the particles that is not a homogeneous mixture. That is the particles do not completely dissolve. Are you following? Such a mixture, in which you may still see traces of the particles in the solution or traces of the salt in the solution, is known as a heterogeneous mixture. Now, with what I've explained, you can see, you can even answer the question that which of the following is not a heterogeneous mixture? Flood water. Flood water can still contain some particles of sand, silt, and clay. You can even still see it, so it's not correct. Writing ink. You can still see the particles of those ink. Are you following? Soft drink like coke. It's not completely clear. But this one is said filtered sea water. Sea water is just salty. Are you following? So if I should take it and filter it, removing all the particles of sand, silt, and clay in it, the water will be what crystal clear. But the point is that it may be what it will be what it will be what salty. But if you see the clear, so you can see that the best answer to this question is option number D and not option number C. Do you understand? So the best answer is option number D, which is filtered sea water and not option C. Hmm? Question number two. Calculate the number of moles of hydrogen ion present in one gm cube of 0.5 m solution of H2SO4. This air here, let me take a pointer. This air that you see here simply means moles per dm cube. Are you following? So this 0.5 m means 0.5 moles per dm cube, which is the molar concentration of the acid. Do you get? 
So they say you calculate the number of moles of hydrogen ion present in one gm cube of 0 0.5 mole per gm cube or uh, molar solution of H2SO4. Are you following? So the first thing you have to do is you have to assume that H2SO4 dissociates. Let's assume that it is a solution. So the hydrogen H2SO4 will dissociate to give what? Hydrogen ion plus what? Tetra sulfate 6 ion. Are you following? Now, if you should write this equation very well, you see that H2SO4, which is the acid, dissociates into what? Two hydrogen ions plus one sulfate ion. Are you following? So I said that from the equation of or from the equation that do H2SO4 will decompose, or you can see dissociate, whichever one. To give two moles of hydrogen ions in solution. Now, concentration of the hydrogen ion, because this simply means one mole of H2SO4, dissociates to give two moles of hydrogen ion and two moles of sulfate ion. Are you following? So, no matter the concentration of the hydrogen ion becomes these two moles times this 0 0.5 molar or 0 0.5 moles per kmq. That's how you get the concentration of this hydrogen ion. So that becomes hydrogen ion becomes 2 times 0 0.5. And that gives you 1 m or 1 moles per gm cube. Now they're asking you to find the number of moles. This one is just the mole ratio. It's not the actual number of moles. To get the actual number of moles, you use the formula that says molar concentration equals number of moles over volume. Molar concentration equals number of moles over volume. Mm -hmm. So when you cross multiply, when you cross multiply, number of moles becomes what? Molar concentration times volume. Molar concentration times volume. So that becomes, what do you get as a molar concentration of H2SO4? You have you got what? One mole per dm cube. So that becomes one times volume. What is the volume? One dm cube. One dm cube. So that becomes one times one. And that becomes one mole. Mm -hmm. Very simple. Just write the equation of reaction to dissociate the hydrogen ion. Use this 2 to multiply the 0 0.5 molar concentration of H2SO4 to get the words concentration of hydrogen ions. After that, use the formula molar concentration equals number of moles over volume. That means then number of moles becomes molar concentration times volume. Then you multiply to get one mole and one mole. That's your words answer. Very simple. Mm -hmm. So the answer is what? 0 1.0 mole. 1.0 more. Very simple. Hmm? Question number three. Given that the mass of a gas occupies 1 dm cube at 300 Kelvin. Hmm? Given that the mass of a gas occupies 1 dm cube at 300 Kelvin. At what temperature will its volume be doubled, keeping the pressure constant? Given that the mass of a gas occupies 1 dm cube at 300 Kelvin, at what temperature will its volume be doubled, keeping the pressure constant? Now, from the gas laws, we know that when the pressure is constant, uh, the volume of a given mass of gas is directly proportional to its temperature. So this is Charles' law that you use in solving it. So from Charles' law, we know that V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. So what's your V1? Your initial volume, 1 dm cube. Mm -hmm. 1 dm cube. What's your V2? They said at what temperature will its volume be doubled? V2 means that the volume will be doubled. So when it's doubled, it becomes 2 times the first volume. That's 2 times 1. That's 2 dm cube. What is T1? First temperature, 300 Kelvin. T2, they're asking you at what temperature will volume be doubled. So T2 is unknown. So substituting the values of V1, T1, over V2, T2, you have 1, which is your 1 dm cube over initial temperature 300 equals V2 when it's doubled, which is 2 over T2. Cross multiply. You have T2 equals 300 times 2, and T2 becomes 600 Kelvin. Very simple. So the answer is what? 600. You must have observed that my background is a little bit shitty and noisy. Please do not uh, mind my background. I don't know what happens today. Today just became suddenly kind of 
very busy and all the motors are just moving up and down. Please ignore my background, forgive my background, and let us continue. Hmm? All right. Question number four. For iodine crystal to sublime on heating, the particles must acquire energy that is. For iodine crystal to sublime on heating, the particles must absorb acquire energy that is. You know, you know what sublimation is, right? Yes, you know what sublimation. What is sublimation? Good, the process whereby what a solid changes into the gaseous state without first passing into a liquid phase. That is sublimation. The process whereby a solid vaporizes to the vapor state without first passing into the liquid phase. That is what sublimation. Now they're asking you the process whereby iodine crystal sublime, iodine crystal changes to the gaseous state without first melting. Mm -hmm. Then I say that for that to happen, what should be the condition? Are you following? Is it that it must acquire energy that is A, greater than the force of attraction in both the solid and liquid phase, equal to the force of attraction in the solid, necessary to melt the solid, less than the force of attraction in the solid? Mm -hmm. Now I say that for sublimation to occur, a substance in the solid state must acquire heat energy which is more than enough to overcome the world intermolecular forces of attraction between, between the molecules of the substance when it is brought in the solid and liquid phase. Are you following me? Mm -hmm. So for a substance to sublime, the substance must acquire enough heat energy, which is more than enough, or more than enough to overcome the world intermolecular forces of attraction both when the, mon the substance is in the world solid and the liquid phase. So for iodine to quickly change into the gaseous state without first melting, it must absorb enough heat energy that is strong enough, are you following, to what break the world intermolecular forces holding the particles in both the solid phase and the liquid phase so that it will just change straight into the gaseous phase. And because of that, the best choice here is option A, which is it must absorb an energy that is what greater than the forces of attraction in both the solid and the liquid phase. You know, in the solid phase, the particles are held together by strong intermolecular or cohesive forces. In the liquid, so in, in that solid phase, they are unable to move. In the liquid phase, the particles are held also by what intermolecular forces or also covalent uh, cohesive forces. But in the liquid phase, the, more the, 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 the cohesive or intermolecular forces is not as strong as that in the solid phase. So the particles can still move about to some extent in the liquid phase. But in the solid phase, they cannot move about at all. But in the liquid phase, they can still move about to some extent. Are you following? So that solid must absorb enough heat that will break that intermolecular forces that is holding the particles in both the solid phase and in the liquid phase that they can move about to some extent so that they will transport straight into the gaseous state where they will move randomly mm -hmm. without any word restriction. So because of that, your best answer is what A. Mm -hmm. Question number five. An element E with the electronic configuration 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p3. The reaction of E with the halogen Y can give. Now you have to think what should this element be? What should this element be? If you add up all this, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p3, you have 2 here, plus 2 here, 4, plus 6 here, 10, plus 2 here, 12, plus 3 here, 15. You see that the element here has an atomic number of 15. E has an atomic number of 15. And because E has an atomic number of 15, E represents the 15th element. That's the meaning. Because that's an atomic number of 15. E represents the 15th element. Now, I said the atomic configuration above represents an element with an atomic number of 15. From our first 20 elements, the 15th element is phosphorus. Mm -hmm. Now, phosphorus forms two compounds with halogens. Example is chlorine. It forms PCL3, which is phosphorus 3 chloride, and PCL5, which is phosphorus 5 chloride. So, 
writing this to fit the above description, we have what EY3 and EY5. Hmm? So that's what I have here EY3 and EY5. Hmm? So I believe you enjoyed this video with the class to dust, irrespective of the background. Um, as you can see here, I also, um, I also use this medium to remind you to do not forget to what? subscribe to our YouTube channel, like our videos, and feel free to always drop your comments or drop a comment on our comment section box on what you think about our videos. Are you following? Okay. So, we are going to call it today. Once again, I'm Mr. Chima from Third Class Tutors, and I'll see you next time. Bye. Stay safe.